I was in Japan for meetings and I teared up on this moment where this contractor said, would you like that to be a one millimeter or two millimeter reveal? Business of Architecture, episode 376. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week I'm speaking to Eric Clough, who is the founder of Manhattan-based design firm 212 Box. Now, Eric was originally from the Midwest, but spent his formative years in both Brussels and London. He graduated from Yao in 1999 and founded 212 Box in late 2000. And 212 Box is actually made up of six companies, which are working in different disciplines and differing sectors. And they've had an incredible array of different projects. They've worked in residential, in retail, with people like Christian Louboutin, Sergio Rossi, Lego and Erdos, um, for the von Furstenberg family, and Philip Roth for residential. And in this conversation, um, Eric goes into a lot of the philosophy and the creativity and how they merge that with the business aspects of 212 Box. Now, 212 Box are brilliant narrators and storytellers, and one of their projects involved kind of hiding a series of clues and hidden narratives within one of the buildings. And Eric's actually given me a riddle for you as the BOA audience to see if you can solve. So here it goes. If anyone listening knows of a scented tree which grows in groves of Jarakanda and has the sure-footedness of a springbok, the industriousness of a beaver, and the vision of an eagle, we hope that you will reach out to that tree and try to tell them that we'd love to meet them. So... There you go. There is the cryptic clue. If you can solve it, get in touch. So sit back, relax and enjoy. Eric Clough. Today's episode is sponsored by Sweet Process. Are you frustrated with how long it takes to get stuff done in your architecture firm or with how chaotic or confusing things seem to get? Well, then let me tell you about a much better way of getting work done and let me tell you about an amazing tool that will help you overcome the frustrating log jams in your architecture firm. Sweet Process is a simple but powerful tool that lets you create clear step-by-step -step instructions for every task in your architecture firm, from onboarding new clients to training employees to responding to client requests. So everything gets done more easily and more reliably. Plus, you'll have a central place where everyone who works with you, your employees, contractors, and even virtual assistants can access your procedures anytime from any device. The best way to understand how Sweet Process streamlines your work is to start using it. The company offers a 14-day free trial, but as a loyal listener of this podcast, you can try for 28 days free of charge. You don't even have to enter a credit card to get started. Just navigate to www.sweetprocess.com forward slash BOA to start your free 28-day trial today. Eric, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. And I can see you there in your stunning offices in Manhattan at 212 Box. Are you, are you guys completely empty at the moment or is everyone working remotely? Uh, um, most people are working remotely. We've been trying to wrestle everyone back, um, but uh, you know it's slow going. Manhattan is uh, very quiet these days, um, so it's just a matter of getting, um, you know, pulling everyone back and encouraging them to come back uh, to the to the office. So, got it, got it, great. So, I I'm I'm interested. You know, you're the the founder of Two One Two Box. You guys started nearly over 20 years ago am i right in saying that yeah we just celebrated 20 years yeah amazing and how did the business begin how what was your entrepreneurial story because i mean that's that's a in itself just having a business for 20 years is an enormous success <laughs> and the kind of work that you do is just it's absolutely extraordinary like just extraordinarily beautiful well crafted thought out and we'll talk more about some of the kind of hidden stories that you like to yeah you know. thanks so much yeah, yeah. no it, um it, it's been an amazing 20 years we um you know i guess it started uh 
well, I started very young, like I was a year and a half out of school. So I came to the city, um, worked numerous jobs, had crazy sleep schedules. I think I had five or six jobs, you know, one full time, but I was doing shop drawings and model making and renderings and stuff. Right. And um, I'd always had uh, businesses. So, you know, I had a furniture business, uh, a loft business in school and, you know, just um, always been an entrepreneur. So I immediately knew uh, I wanted to start a business and, you know, I kept taking a, a friend, a, a mentor, like a, a professor of mine um, out to dinner and, and pitching these ideas. And, you know, I think after the 14th dinner, he said, actually, yeah, I think that would work. And it was this, you know, idea for our glass box project, which is really the namesake of the firm. Right. Um, so I had, uh, you know, I was a little bit dramatic back then. And I, you know, was insistent on like really creating a business plan around concept. And um, I flew to Iceland, I think, for the millennium, uh, spent two weeks in a hotel and, you know, traipsing around in the snow, um, searching for my business plan related to the glass box. And so um, I actually, you know, took, well, I was reading Corbusier at the time and um, I think towards a new architecture, he had the, his lessons of Rome and the classification of parts. Um, so he had drawn a cylinder, a pyramid, a cube, mm. the, that rectangular cuboid and a sphere, you know, being the basis of the shapes. And so I thought, well, if I could, if I could take those and, and really describe everything I wanted to do, because I, I really, mm. you know, loved architecture and interiors, but also graphics and products. Like I really in, um, enjoyed making things. So it, it all comes from the desire and love of making things. So uh, anyway, I, I took that diagram and I, I you know, slapped a, a kind of graphic on the cylinder, you know, and thought, well, that would be graphics and, and a way of, you know, everything would be composed and, uh, you know, beautiful composition. And you'd talk about branding and creating stories. Um, on the pyramid, I, I flipped it upside down so that, you um, you know, you can balance one pyramid on another point that would be architecture and that would be feats of engineering and, you know, some type of design ethos. And uh, the cube I wrapped with a little bow to become a product and, uh, you know, really thinking about materials and the process and craft of making things. Mm -hmm. And then if you duplicate that uh, cuboid, you, you know, it's always about the relationship between, um, you know, like objects and the distance and light and air. So, you know, thinking about real estate, but, you know, really understanding real estate as, you know, the, the budgetary constraints and, um, you know, you really need a, a solid business plan on each project. So there's, you know, the team players and the schedule and, you know, yeah. what, what vision and concept you're going to, um, you know, create with each project. And then, um, you know, I, re I really, I always have, this love of film. So the sphere, it was a little weak, but I, I created sort of a, um, uh, a yin yang of, of thinking about like storytelling and always a protagonist and antagonist or, you know, what could you describe? I had a really great class on ornamentation. So in the details, what are all the stories? And, mm -hmm. you know, can you, can you hide things in the details that really create a lot of things? So, um, you know, we're constantly telling stories through the project. So that to me was, was the basis of, oh, I've got five, you know, just like the, the important classification of those parts, I've got five disciplines that we can really span. And it's, you know, our love of interest in each one of those. So, um, you know, we just, we really think of each project holistically and, and go you know, kind of run through all those disciplines. And then as a result, the, co the company kind of, you know, built up uh, like a products department with, you know, full logistics and graphics. And, uh, you know, we were doing a lot of fun projects. Um, so, we, you know, it's funny, we hire a lot of architects and, and, you know, people out of architecture school, but there's always that insistence of, of you know, what else do you love to do and, um, and create? Because um, it, it's funny, I always, then I use the cube, 
as a sixth box is, you know, sort of sixth side of the box where um, that is all about, you know, collaborating with people and artisans and craftsmen, but also just, you know, all the employees in the office mm. that really, um, you know, really utilizing their talent. So, so from the, when you, when you came up with this, the concept for the business of being kind of multidisciplinary, disciplinary um and you yeah. kind of start crafting out these different ideas for service offering offerings what were the first projects if you remember that came into the business that allowed you to get started if you like and how did you you know it's interesting when you when you're setting up a very creative business like that like how did you know where to put your focus and not kind of be you know disperse into always doing something new yeah, well, so it's funny starting an architecture business um, like that. You know, we had our own idea, and and it really started with the glass box. So the name two and two box comes from the area code um, where you are, and then you know this idea of putting glass boxes, um, and essentially the glass box. You know, just describing that project, it was a, a glass box on stilts over parking lots in dense urban areas. There was a bunch of billboards being built everywhere um, or there were advertising on the sides of buildings. Yeah. And I kept thinking, you know, the empty lots are the people, you know, those landowners are not receiving any advertising revenue from the building, you know, that's that that's hosting the, the advertisement. So uh, billboards had just started coming up. So I thought, well, if you can expand that into a livable space, you could have two streams of revenue for that landowner, you know, um, the the leasable space and then the advertising and we were we were embedding uh, LCD liquid display systems uh, you know that were animated and video content like that's progressed so much you know <laughs> since the last twenty years but um, you know that idea where we would own and lease these and and then you know create um, products and furniture and content that would go in them um, but then also I took it you know further and, and made these um, it, the glass box to me was a character. And so I started telling stories and I wrote this big trilogy film that I wanted to be a big Hollywood feature and stuff. Um, and now, sorry, I, I'm to say all that, that was our first six months of, you know, we were part of consuming places, uh, creative times um, exhibition. And, you know, a lot of that changed after nine 11 and, and things yeah. uh, you know, the exhibition moving and stuff, but um, you know, for, the, for that first year, we were working. We were working on our own project, but we did get phone calls, and you know that also saved a bit of the business. On on oh, can you do a residential project? Um, you know, we started with the townhouse in Gramercy Park, um, and I should say, you know, like an apartment on one floor, and then we met, you know, all the other neighbors, and we ended up doing nine different apartments, or sorry, seven different apartments out of the nine apartments in the, <laughs> in the uh, townhouse. So it just, we went very quickly from, you know, uh, a couple of people to, to, you know, seven to 10 people right away. And then back then that was the roaring twenties. So uh, in Manhattan, meaning like, you know, we were meeting people at parties at night and signing contracts the next morning. Yeah. And there were just a, a lot of renovations and a lot of work. So, you know, I just, it was really fortunate to, to one start with like such a heavily concept, you know, business plan, but then um, wrapping right into a lot of residential work and then retail and commercial. Um, but, it, but it's funny, sorry, maybe using another example is, is um, you know, three, four years later, we, we were doing a lot of residential and, you know, we sort of lost that like, oh, what about all these other disciplines? I mean, you know, we were doing some graphic work uh, for the 2012 Olympics and things like that. But yeah. um, we, you know, we took the opportunity on, on which is now this apartment renovation that's been turned to mystery on Fifth Avenue. That was really stretching it ba all back, all five disciplines, plus, you know, collaborations. Um, within all these incredible craftsmen and workmen that, you know, that's, uh, we wrote an entire novel. Sorry, I, if we, I don't, you know, jumping into the mystery on Fifth Avenue, it was, uh, 
a project that really ran away from us in a, in a really good way, but it was just a matter of, um, you know, just creating all this, uh, creative content for, mm. you know, one family in a Upper East Side apartment. So, but when, when, um, when did that project happen? The mystery on fifth Avenue? It started in 2004. It was completed in, uh, middle of 07. And then, well, it, sorry, uh, if I back up, it, it was like a year and a half of construction, um, but we were planting all these clues within the apartment. And then it took another year and a half to kind of like sew it all together, finish the book, write the answer book at the same time, you know, and and really um, create all these clues. So, and again, I don't know. Yeah, so if, if we, because this is such a, this is, yeah, step back, this is such a fascinating project. And it, it sounds like it's it was one of these kind of, pivotal projects it was one of the first projects i came across um with, with with the practice and was kind of just fell in love with the concept of it and so it was obviously one of your earlier residential projects but the amount of thought and detail that's gone into it and the kind of continue and, and also the kind of the marketing genius behind a lot of it and the, <laughs> and the storytelling could you tell us a little bit about what that project is and how it came about well it was it was a, a large uh beautiful apartment. It was um, one uh, fifth of an old triplex apartment. That was Marjorie Merriweather Post's um, apartment uh, turn of the century. So it was one of the biggest um, triplexes. And, uh, you know, the, the, the family was just amazing. There were four kids, they would all come to the meetings and, you know, all the kids were asking about their rooms. And so, um, you know, I just I, I turned to the clients and, and said, uh, you know, is there there's something I can do for the kids? Like, it'd be so fun to create kind of a wonderland. And, um, you know, we, we had this the the plan was such that the master bedroom was was facing Central Park. And then midway, you know, all the the beautiful living areas was in the front. And then there was a, a moment where I created a homework den and then it was kind of kids land behind. So. Um, uh, I just thought, well, there, there's, it's ripe for, for trying to inspire them. Like what could we do that might inspire and, you know, plant little seeds in, into their young minds to really, um, you know, maybe change the way and alter the, you know, their thinking later in life. Mm. Um, and so, <laughs> Subtle brainwashing throughout the house. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> so, um, I, I mean, it was funny, like it's a cyclical equation where, I was inspired by the kids and then we were trying to inspire them. So we had to run out to, uh, you know, our mill worker and various craftsmen and encourage them, like saying, look, th this is your, you know, we maintain the same budget. If you're going to build a credenza, you could build it this way. Or how about doing, you know, going an extra mile and adding a bunch of stuff, um, hand carved stuff that, you know, is really on your time. Mm -hmm. But if you want to, be a part of this bigger project. So we were then trying to inspire all these other um, artisans to, to pitch in. And all of that was then just to re-inspire re the kids again. So um, yeah, essentially the, we, we wrote an entire novel that was hidden in the apartment. It was a 236 page book that uh, the, you know, two, um, five parts, the odd chapters would lead you um, uh, through the historical nature of the apartment. Like we traced inspiration through 38 historical figures, then to Marjorie Merriweather posts. So right. we really tried to embed the history in the apartment again. And then um, the, the even chapters where you would run around the apartment and find different clues. So there were 18 clues that were uncovered and we, we tried to, you know, ciphers, uh, various mathematics, um, all, all these sculptures, a whole CD of original music through four centuries um, of, of kind of uh, melodies. And um, yeah, it was, it was just endless um, poems and riddles and, you know, big climactic <laughs> moments where you're cranking credenzas open to reveal, you know, huge uh, maps and letters and, and fun things. So um, it really, it got away with us from us, but uh, you know, roping it all in and really connecting all the dots was a huge challenge, but really so much fun. 
Amazing. How did you get time yeah. to write a whole novel? Was it you personally wrote the novel or did you have like a team of yeah. you doing it? Well, they, we, there was uh, three or four of us doing tons of research on it. I was kind of laying out the plot lines, but um, no, a, a wonderful woman in the office um, wrote the entire novel. And uh, so it was, um, yeah, it was just spectacular. And, uh, you know, we've since tried to expand that project into a much larger project, which is, is fun too. So uh, it's really, it's really had an amazing effect on the, both the business and the life of the, the firm. And in terms of where the business is today and the kind of work or the vision that you had in that, in that business model, how close is the business today to what you had envisioned in that trip to Iceland? <laughs> um, it, it's very close. We, we have a, 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 you know, business for each one of the disciplines and right. um, you know, we ebb and flow through um you know, how much, how much time we're doing graphics or, or, uh, you know, like uh, sole um, dedicated projects, mm -hmm. I, I guess I mean. So um, everything centers around the architecture and, and then it's really how we infuse all those other disciplines in the, in architecture projects. But, um, you know, uh, sorry, another way of, of, of answering that is um, it's absolutely maintained that same trajectory, meaning um, we always bring all of those elements into uh, projects. And then also we have our own fun, you know, project that we're constantly, you know, it's a 20 year plus project that now has grown and, you know, we're chipping away at it. And yeah, so it's, you know, like the glass box, uh, it's, it's almost, a, you know, a self-funded project and, um, really has its own interesting legs and stuff. And, and so with some, with the individual disciplines within the office, are they kind of completely separated businesses now in their own rights or how does it, how does it work as a business structure? Yeah. On, uh, I mean, every business is, a, is, um, you know, a different LLC, but really the, the staff, you could be an employee on both sides and it's, um, you know, it's, it shares the same staff and we all are doing um, all, <laughs> we're doing too many things, um, you know, for, for every project, but. So, so in, in uh, terms of how you've, you've set that up, you've obviously, you've got, you've got two on two box film, you've got code box. Yeah. Is that right? Code box, the code box is the um, umbrella company, which is the kind of admin company. And then yes, the, there's a products LLC, a film LLC, um, et cetera. So. Got it. Okay. Um, got it. So you've got code box. That's, but that's the umbrella company that kind of has everything. And then you've got two on two on yeah. uh, two on two box film and then box architecture. Yeah. Every, everything is a code like the, the, the glass box. If you take away the, uh, the the area code we had three asterisks because it was based on the number keypad and then it's um no one could ever pronounce the three asterisks in the box so that became code box your area code box and um and then yeah it's uh you know two, it's funny two and two box it just stuck you know based on that on the glass box project and um there are so many times where I think the name is so inappropriate now, you know, from what we're doing, but um, uh, it really, it will have a, a funny life and trajectory later as people, um, you know, as we piece together all these other, you know, bigger projects. So. And how, and how has your role changed from the early days in 2000 to now? What, what sorts of things have you found that you do more of now that you weren't expecting that you do? Uh, yeah, well, I'm still designing constantly and, uh, you know, um, I still hand sketch everything and, and um, do these overhead perspectives of, of like really just constantly jumping into the space and then, you know, still writing stories and, and, um, you know, creating those elements around, um, you know, so it's always sort of filtering through all those, those, um, disciplines. So, yeah. um, 
Yeah, I think the only, well, what truly changed and uh, when we when we met Christian Louboutin, we, this was around, uh, well, 04, we did his first store, or sorry, his um, first store in the US um, yep. on, on Horatio Street in the West Village. And, and then w- there was a break and they uh, were really shuffling around and growing immensely in, in 07. So when they br- brought a new CEO on and it just full expansion. And, you know, we've done 161 stores over 14, well, 12 to 14 years or something. So wow. um, I was on the road three weeks a month. Um, and so that really, <laughs> that was a, a huge shift and change. Um, and, you know, I, I did travel a lot before, but that was, uh, you know, quite different. Um, you know, each store we had uh, at least five trips um, to the store. And so, and I was doing a lot of that traveling. So it really changed the nature of working remotely and, you know, sketching and sending it. And it was like the time change was <laughs> beautiful for that, where, you know, I could, I could be working and, and sending stuff and having it drawn and stuff. But um, yeah, that was, uh, that was an incredible time where really um, our products and our, like sort of our efficiency as an office just um, was incredible uh, humming of, of logistics and, and making sure like, you know, tile samples were at, in some hotel waitings to be approved to then, you know, 40,000 tiles then to show up on time for stores. And, you know, we, we well, that, created. That, that, that's, that's quite an extraordinary yes, effort in coordination. How many, how many stores did you say you've done for Christian Louboutin? 200 and I, I think it falls somewhere around 161 <laughs> projects. Um, yeah. I mean, that was both office spaces, headquarters, retail, um, you know, well, a majority of the stores, but we were doing a lot of, um, you know, other office stuff for them. But uh, and this is right across the world from Hong Kong to Miami to. To uh, Australia, Europe. Yeah. Um, you know, we did probably 95 to 99% of the, uh, of the stores in that time. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it was incredible. Like every store was, uh, was different. So we really, you know, Christian and I would, would talk about the city we were going into and, and talk about the cultural aspects and doing a lot of research. And then, you know, I would go and, um, meet the craftsmen and artisans and really, we, you know, we would always try to do something locally, make something locally and celebrate that kind of cultural exchange. And, um, each one of those uh, were, were just an incredible opportunity to, you know, all we needed was the signature niches and a red carpet. And then everything was, was really up for grabs. I mean, um, there's some, there's some funny moments of, of me perfectly inter- <laughs> interpreting Christian and, and everything, you know, he loved and versus you know, misinterpreting it, but in a really great way. Um, there's a funny, the Brazil store, we were traveling and he said, um, oh, I want, I, you know, I'd love to make a, a new language. Like I want to really create a language on this, on the Br- Brazil store. And, you know, I think he, w- well, later in retrospect, he was meaning sort of like a kit of parts that would, that would really define his brand. And, mm. and then, you know, we could implement. And I, I, we were tired. We were on the, a plane and I, I interpreted it as he wanted a whole language. Like I was thinking of hieroglyphics and all this, you know, crazy thing. So um, I went back and we, you know, my nephew at the time had just thrown away this piece of graph paper. He was trying to occupy his mind and he was drawing these in every square of the grid. He was drawing these crazy little symbols. And I, I called his mother and said, oh, you know, can you grab that out of the trash and send it to me? Because um, it really sparked this idea of, of creating this kind of bigger language of, you know, 400 symbols. So we scanned it and used some of his symbols. But then also uh, we took 38 world languages and created, you know, there were about 1600 
different um, uh, glyphs and uh, just these incredible strokes that uh, we just coated the entire store with these mm. wood tiles that were etched and burned. And, and, and to me, it was like, oh, this is our new coded language. And, you know, it was amazing how you walked up to the store and you felt like you could read all these messages, but it was completely cryptic, you know, because nothing kind of matched up. Um, I mean, it was a huge success. Like Christian loved it, but it was this funny misinterpretation of, of, of his, um, his request. But he would always throw us those, those beautiful moments where, you know, he would find stuff in, in antique, uh, like he would purchase things at auction and say, here, you've, you've got to put this in. Um, uh, like he's a real collector, an amazing, uh, amazing eye. So how, how did you um, meet him? I met him, uh, well, through Diane von Furstenberg. Uh, we had done work for her family and her daughter, Tatiana and, and Alex. Um, we had talked about a bunch of stuff. And um, uh, yeah, it was funny. It was in 04. And um, I think uh, she said, my friend Christian is building a shoe store down the street. Um, could you help him out? And I went to the meeting and I had... <laughs> <laughs> no idea who I, I wasn't watching sex in the city at that point. And um, so I, you know, we met and just hit it off. He's just a lovely, charming man who, uh, you know, so generous and lovely. Mm. And um, I came back and, you know, everyone was yelling at me in the office, not realizing who I had just met. And, and so, uh, you know, the next day we started um, this beautiful little shoe story. So um, it, it was really uh, wonderful that, you know, Diane connected us and, um, yeah, it was just a real treat. It was interesting. You were saying about working with Christian, how that really made the office focus on efficiencies or it gave you opportunity to work on efficiencies. What, what, did you, what did you mean by that? What sorts of things or processes were you guys getting really good at kind of being repeatable and making them predictable? Yeah. Well, so for all their display systems, we were creating, you know, different shelf designs and, and displays and all the acrylic displays. Um, I had interpreted that niche uh, to be then a, an acrylic transparent display. Mm. Um, and then that just, you know, all these derivative products came out of that. And then, you know, we were finding the budgets really tight at that time. So, um, you know, thinking like, okay, well, how we've got to, make this work and stretch the dollar. And, um, you know, what, this has changed the business a lot in that in, in every project, I just hate that the, you know, when you divide, you take a unit of, of, um, of money and, and saying, okay, you know, like half of it goes to middle trades people and like, you know, um, everyone's taking a cut of something. And, and we've really, we, there's a design build aspect to our firm where we take on a lot of the millwork and metal work and, and um, you know, some of our, well, what became our products and said, look, we'll organize this and we'll make it. Like we were really, we were, we're makers of things. So we, yeah. we, we can do this. And um, we ended up, you know, all the wall materials. So, from wood tile, stone tile, leather panels, studded leather, embroidered leather, embossed leather, everything. Um, we just ended up manufacturing ourselves. And, um, you know, we would, we would design a material, a new material for every store. And then we would, you know, have that kind of leak into two or three stores, but then just constantly um, brushing up. So it just kept us anything we sketched and, and, kind of dreamt up it, it was prototyped in three weeks and it was in a store three months later so it was uh, pretty incredible um the momentum and those those efficiency i mean one of the biggest um and best things we did was you know was hire a staff for logistics and um and just really procurement um and scheduling and logistics all became so important and um the, that's where I think we really strived. And, you know, that, that, that carries through on every single project. Um, we can really, even our development projects now, um, we take the mill work and metal work out and we organize it ourselves. And, right. um, 
every dollar you know that you spend goes into the project and um i uh, sorry just maybe reinforce that i i we had um an employee leave and then go to a larger firm but she came back and uh she really said you know everything we designed ended up getting cut and you know it was um either you know, value engineered and, and reorganized. And, uh, you know, I, everything I just spent a year on designing didn't get built. And um, she had, she had mentioned like why I came back is that, you know, it's so lovely that um, 99% of the, the things we draw stay within the project and, and really become um, a part of the project. So uh, I, I really, you know, I love that about our firm is that, um, we, you know, we take on a lot of that design build, um, but for good reason. So yeah. it always benefits the client and, and the project itself. And how, how is your office structured at the moment? How, how many people are you and what does the leadership team and the hierarchy oh, look like? Yeah, we're, is we're, yeah, no, uh, well, I have a business partner, Yun, um, uh, and we were, classmates at, at school together. We've known each mm. other for 25 years. And then she joined us in 2004. Um, the, we're, we're, we're a small boutique design firm, but we really stretch and, and mold, you know, it's based per project. So, you know, we're, we average, I don't know, 16 people, but, um, you know, we fluctuate uh, to seven to 10 at, at times versus, you know, to 20, but I mean, that's all within a small, you know, design firm. Uh, we really rely heavily on craftsmen and artisans to, to um, you know, a lot of people we've worked through the years and um, those are big, larger extended teams. Got it, got it. And in, in terms of, you know, the, the different types of project typologies that you have going on now in the office, how much of your work is still, you know, primarily residential or, or has working with Christian kind of meant that you've now got a, a, like a, a, a lot of retail types of projects that you're working on and where's the main. Yeah. We always flip business? back and forth, you know, it was sort of like 80, 20 always that where it flips, right. you know, when we were doing all the Louboutin stores, it was uh, about 80% of the business, but um, it, you know, then it flips. Uh, we're doing ma mainly residential now, and uh, although we, you know, finished a big flagship store in Beijing um, for another, you know, cashmere fashion brand, um, the, I mean, it's fun. The residential has gotten us into. Um, well, it, we've done yachts and planes, and you know, even our graphics. We've done this in <laughs> this incredible. Um, graphic on a on a private plane that had um, it was a reinterpretation of a a, a Lichten, uh, Roy Lichtenstein's um, kind of cartoon, and we created these superheroes as the kids. Uh, well, one because Marvel doesn't let you put Iron Man on the side of a plane, but um, uh, <laughs> we we said, oh, okay, why don't we, you know turn the kids into their own superhero. So, um, uh, no, it's really fascinating. Like, uh, the, we, we just finished this, um, big penthouse in Houston where, um, again, I, we, well, we're, we're just doing a, a big coffee table book on it right now where it talks about all the 50 artisans that we've collaborated with. And, um, so, all these extraordinary objects and details that we created, um, lots of fun little hidden things. We did this mm. beautiful 25 foot curiosity cabinet that, um, you know, expands and uh, there is anyway, fun little secret buttons. If you push it, the entire apartment transforms into a disco. <laughs> but um, uh, anyway, it's, uh, yeah. So it, the, the the types of clients that you that you work with obviously um kind of a very high net worth i would presume some of the um some of the apartments and a lot of the high-end 
uh, retail work that you've been doing. How do you, how do you network in that kind of circles? How do you, how do you constantly keep bringing in more work? How do you win the work? And how, yeah, and, and I suppose the broader question is, is how do you build, how do you build and cultivate a network like that? Yeah. Um, well, everything has been a referral for us. So even that first uh, Gramercy Park townhouse, mm. it was just, you know, one referral to three and then three to nine and to 27. It just became exponential. So uh, we've been really fortunate that way. Um, you know, there was a time, you know, when we were doing all the stores, uh, we sort of lost our footing in, in Manhattan, you know, just because I was traveling so much. Um, but, you know, that led to a lot of international projects um, as well. But um, when we built this big showcase office uh, down on Wall Street, um, I really wanted to to go back and sort of reach back into the, the roots of all those clients and, um, you know, all those uh, incredible people we had met. Mm. So we we called um, we called our first client and. Um, asked them to bring 20 people and we ended up having these secret dinner series in our office um so uh these three tables nest together you know there there's two conference tables and a coffee table and we have this big performance um where these uh four uh models will turn the tables and um assemble it uh, so that it's one big, one big, long 23 foot table. Mm. And then, um, you know, we'll, we'll host these um, big dinners. So they've been lovely evenings. And then we've, we've networked again and, and spread out. Um, uh, and that's been really incredible. We started that, that series in 2018, 2019. And, you know, we've taken a short break. Yes. <laughs> from the day. Yeah. But, how, um, how, how have you been able to um, continue your networking endeavors, if you like, during COVID? Um, yeah, well, it, it's funny. Uh, COVID has given us more of a, a, of a fun time for reflection of the 20 years. So, um, you know, I went through uh, all of our projects and reorganized everything and then, um, you know, talked to old clients and, and during that time and really reconnected with people. But um, the... Uh, you know, I'm constantly like thinking about the business plan and, and, and the trajectory and, and, you know, we've, ha we've had time to write more. We wrote two short films in that time. And um, some of the, the bigger, larger films, the Hollywood big full feature things that we want to do and aspirations. Mm. Um, so, you know, that, but also uh, residential projects, the, the ones we're doing now are so large that, you know, they're two to three year projects. So um, we, you know, there was a, a three or four month gap in the construction, but um, for the most part that carried on. So we were really fortunate to, to constantly work and, you know, we're, we're still constantly ordering all the, the materials and the interior packages right. and stuff. So, um, you know, that, that all went seamlessly, you know, knock on wood. <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm curious to hear about your Hollywood aspirations and the feature length films that you guys are involved. Are you allowed to speak about some of those? I'll say on the residential project in Houston that we just finished, mm -hmm. I wanted to, you know, it's a really lovely, um, incredible, uh, penthouse where we photographed it and then got 600 different images. And I kept thinking like, they're still not telling the complete story, like of really being able to experience it. So we, um, you know, during COVID, we, I have a great writing partner and we wrote a, you know, two short films. One is just a seven minute um, fun, very quiet film that uh, two characters kind of um, dance around the apartment, meaning in a, um, kind of mental gymnastics uh, uh, towards one another. And then versus right. uh, we ended up doing a, a, a retelling of uh, old Twilight Zone, uh, like a re reinterpretation of it. And so, you know, I'm, we're in the midst of um, 
doing all the pre-production stuff for that. And those, those moments, you know, I, I thought, well, every residential project um, we finish, I, I, I'd really love to do that is write, you know, small little short films that accompany each, because I think the architecture really speaks in that way. And, you know, you see the light changing and the, and um, you know, just the, the difference between day and night within all the materials mm. we've chosen and, um, you know, and all of those subtle details are, are all the things that we really obsess over and, and care yeah. about. So, um, yeah, that and, uh, you know, sorry, our, the other big answer to that is we, you know, I have a huge, uh, you know, the Mr. M Fifth Avenue has grown into this other larger project that's 20, 30 years long. And um, I've been hiding things all over the world, um, you know, for it. And it's, uh, it's a really, uh, our hope is to inspire and um, inspire a whole lot of people to come together to build and create um, a, a monument to creativity. So um, we, we, it, <laughs> There's a lot. Anyway, there, there's small stepping stones, but we've been hiding things all over the place. And um, we have, you know, big aspirations to have this uh, uh, really unify a whole lot of people. Um, you know, th within everything I've been saying and, and kind of like, you know, thinking about narrative and architecture, mm. the one thing I, I really believe in, in is the only way we're all going to unify globally is to store, you know, to kind of go back to creating and making things together and storytelling. So, yeah. you know, if we're telling some of the same stories, you know, which is all happening, um, it, it's a really a way, you know, I found this on all the stores, like really working with local craftsmen and just the difference between building something in Japan or Dubai or Europe or, or you know, the US, um, you just really, understand the culture and the way, you know, the thought process and, and the details, like, you know, I, I, I was in Japan for meetings and I teared up on this moment where this contractor said, would you like that to be a one millimeter or two millimeter reveal? And I, I just, <laughs> <You're> it like, <laughs> was, <laughs> you know, where, where, you know, in some parts of the U S we're talking about a quarter inch or a half inch, but, um, it was just this incredible moment. And I, you know, of course said one millimeter and, um, and it really drove this the, at home of like, um, well, that even that store, I came back to the office and said, what is the thinnest line we can make, at, you know, within a material. And it ended up being like acid etched, you know, like photo etching metal. And so we did all these um, brass tiles that were photo etched and then origami, like you had to fold them and, um, back, they were all backlit. So you would just find that little crisp moment of, um, you know, that the thinnest little line of light. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I just, you know, in that, um, that that's when what's been so wonderful over the last 20 years of, of traveling of, of really getting to know, um, different methods and ways of doing things that are just extraordinary. And, and just even the mindset of, of, um, you know, everyone on site and, and contributing. So how, how have you, I mean, with, with a practice like 212 box where there is such a strong creative energy and force in everything that you do. And just like the, and the passion, I can hear you talking about all your projects and the intricacies and the stories that are woven through them. How do you balance that with the, with the kind of cut and dry aspects of business and the, and the sort of the need to make profit and those kinds of economical questions. Do the two ever, are the two ever in conflict with each other? I don't think so. I, you know, I guess I would answer, it's really the curiosity of, of I think everyone in our firm and, and in the past, it's been this, this, curiousness of um, how can we, you know, think through this in a way, like I, I actually think 
two and two box is more of a thought process. I mean, I, you know, I feel right. like we're two things. We're a family and then we're a thought process of, of a way of thinking and solve, you know, problem solving. And, you know, you click through, you know, thinking of all those different disciplines, but um, the project never suffered. Like, even if it's a tight budget, that's the opportunity, right? Like that, you know, um, how can we, you know, do this extraordinary thing with just this amount of money or, um, you know, that's really where just phone calls and inspiring people to go beyond what, you know, they were really going to originally deliver, um, you know, can you encourage them to do something more? And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's funny how even storytelling in that process can change so much in, in convincing and, and, um, showing, you know, that, that different thought process of, of, um, you know, always, oh, like I had to rewrite our employee agreement and, and, and sort of, uh, or the handbook. And it was, you know, I, I wrote this, like th there won't, you know, you, this isn't the firm to do it the easiest way. Like we will do it the hardest way. We will, you know, spend, you know, 40, 80, one, you know, like all these additional hours on just this moment because it, it, it makes a difference and it, and it's yeah. really important. And, you know, it was, would have been very easy on any of those tile projects where, you know, you just replicate the same tile over and over versus really drawing 1600 different um, <laughs> types of tile and only ordering 9,000 of them, you know, like it was, uh, it, it really made a difference to me and to everyone. And, um, and I think it shows in all those details. So it's, it's the curiosity that really pulls through, I think, and, and constantly runs through a lot of our work. And um, I think that's made all the difference. Amazing. And what's, what's in store for you guys in 2021 post COVID hopefully. Oh, yeah. Well, we're working on, uh, well, this, um, we're working on this big uh, book, you know, that is finally, um, you know, a, a nice way to encapsulate that beautiful project. Uh, we've got um, uh, a bunch of new residential projects. Um, and, you know, I, I'm really hoping we, I, I'd love to do more. Well, we, we haven't done any hospitality, so I'd re really love to do, some hotels, um, you know, internationally, domestically, like we were really close 2019, uh, you know, just doing a, a big hotel project. And then um, it ended up uh, changing ownership and stuff. So, um, mm. but uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, that would really sh be able to showcase like, you know, how fun, would it be to find things in a hotel room <laughs> that, that, you know, is this meant to be here? And, um, you know, we always do some, we always love putting in a few surprises here and there on projects. So, um, well, you, you, know, could, you, could, you could imagine that into you could imagine that kind of concept of the novel when in a hotel and the kind of, yeah, uncovering and finding things in your room would, would work really well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, I like our residential has really um, uh, created these incredible opportunities to do that a lot for just you know families. And so um, we there's there's an incredible project um, we're doing that is more about a legacy uh, project, and it's really about the generations of the family that will discover things that you know, their grandparents kind of put in place. And um, wow. that I think is, is going to be, you know, really special. Um, and I, I mean, that, that's, I have to tiptoe around this a little bit, but, but, you know, we've, for this particular project, we've constructed a, a whole new language, a whole new mathematics. So we've, we've done a lot of incredible, crazy work, um, you know, just to 
to create uh, this longer story for, you know, a family. And then what I hope to be uh, kind of more of a, a network of families that um, would experience this. So Amazing. anyway, lot. <laughs> Amazing. Well, I, I, I look forward to, uh, to when I'm next in New York coming and saying hello. In, oh, we'd in, love to have you. Yeah. Face to face and kind of visiting some of your, your work. Cause I'm, as I said, I'm totally enamored with the, the beauty and the, the thoughtfulness that goes into every single project. And it's been a fascinating insight in hearing how you've been thinking about those projects and how you kind of liaise and work behind the scenes to deliver them. So Eric, thank you so much for your time. Oh, and absolutely. Thank today. you so much. My pleasure. Really appreciate it. Okay. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.